All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Coffee Break. Today we have a special guest in the studio. We have KC <laughs> Badger with us. Um, yeah, super stoked to have you here. Welcome, brother. Welcome to Avid Max. Thank you. This place is great. Oh, Thanks thank for having you. us. Heck yeah. Uh, lots going on, man. Just give us, for the people who don't know who KC Badger is, maybe go through like where you're from, you know, the 411 on, on, on who, who Casey is. All right. Um, yeah, well, all right. <laughs> That's um, a lot, right? Yeah, I don't know. That's a lot. Well, I'm old, so yeah, I'm 41, <laughs> which seems insane to say out loud, but I grew up in Phoenix, um, started fly fishing when I was seven with my dad in the eastern Arizona White Mountains. Um, kind of took a break after he passed away when he was 18, when I was 18. Rode BMX bikes from there on out. Um, rode bikes for a living till I was, you know, I think I was getting paid till I was 31-ish. Oh snap, that's a long time being a pro it riding was, BMX bikes. I mean, it's defined pro. I mean, I lived on like ramen noodles and had eight roommates. Um, but then yeah, I picked up the fly rod kind of right, a little bit of overlap. Like I knew that riding wasn't kind of checking all the boxes like it used to be. So I picked up the fly rod again that, you know, I kind of stashed away after my dad passed away and kind of got addicted from there. Uh, moved to Portland, Oregon full time nine years ago. Oh, wow. So I've been in the Northwest for, you know, better part of a decade now. And I used to go out there when I was riding bikes in the summers just to escape the Arizona heat. So it's kind of funny, I didn't fish then, but now I'm like, I wish I would have fished then. Steelhead runs were so good back then. True. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's still good. Hindsight's always 2020 when it comes to fishing. So I, retired military dude, I was stationed in the Springs when I was 18. Yeah. Fished once. <laughs> fished once. I lived there for four years. Yeah. Why I fished once. And then moving back and getting back into it, I was like, man, I'm an idiot. Yeah, like, I feel like what that. Was I like, doing? That's kind of how I felt when I picked up the fly rod again. Like, right. I instantly I was just like, I just want to see if I can still do this, you know? Like, yeah. and I picked it up and I was like, okay, I can still cast. Caught a fish. And I was like, oh, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, same, like, traveling because of bikes so much. Like, I spent two weeks in New Zealand and on the rivers, basically, and was just like, yeah, it'd be cool if I fished. Like, yeah. yeah. No doubt. So how long have you been connected with Reddington? Hmm. I think it's been about 12 years now. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it happened pretty quick. Um, yeah, well, maybe walk the dog on that, because I think a yeah. lot of people don't understand how do you become, because you're not, you're not an affiliate, you're a ambassador. Yeah, I hate that word, but yeah, that works. Well, I, think <laughs> I don't know what word you should use. It's yeah, just an overused yeah. term. Like, I don't like the word ambassador. I don't like influencer. I think it's because I'm old and, and maybe I am was conditioned to like this lifestyle, so to speak, like being a professional bike rider. And that's kind of basically how it transitioned. It was, I was part of like being a professional bike rider at the time was like social media was pretty new, yeah. but it was obviously like a thing. So we were all on it, using it. And, and I always just used it to like whatever I was doing was what I was putting out in the world. Like yeah. whether it was bikes or like, you know, I do art, so it was art stuff and it was, you know, whatever it happened to be at the time. And, and you know, when I started fishing again, I got super addicted and that's all I did. So that's all my social media was, was fishing. And I got a random Twitter message one day and it was just like, hey, I have a fly fishing question. And and at the time, like, I used to get BMX kids, like, they would kind of open up a conversation however they could. And then it would just all ultimately revolt into, like, hey, can you give me free bike parts? You know? <laughs> right. So, and I was, like, and I was kind of hesitant on it. And I was, like... You know, at the time I was working like a, a retail job and it was pretty slow and I was like, I mean, I'll field it. Okay, I'm like shoot, what's your, what's your fly fishing question? Ha like love to talk about fly fishing, you know? And he's just like, hey, my name's Emiliano Granado. I'm a professional photographer. These are my clients. And he had like all these crazy client lists and he's like, we're doing a fly fishing shoot. You look like you would be cool. Do you want to come to the Deschutes for three days and we'll pay you to go fishing? And I was like, what? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, this is a joke. You know, like I was like, it's a Twitter message. Like how real could this be? Right. Like went on his website, it was real, called him on the phone. Like he's like, yeah. He's like, I mean, we'd love to have you if you want to do it. So that was a Reddington shoot, which is funny because I was fishing a Reddington at the time. Like I just bought like an old CPX on Craigslist basically. And that's the rod that I was fishing. And I was like, this is perfect. I'm already fishing a Reddington rod. Yeah. Like we're, I'm in, like I love the brand. Like it kind of speaks to me as like a younger counterculture person. You know, it did a little bit at the time. And you know, obviously we kind of went full in, but I did that trip 
came home from that trip and I was like, that was insane. Like, I can't believe I just got paid to go fly fishing. Like, I was like, that was a once in a lifetime thing. I'm done. You Hopes, know, like, literally. that was crazy. You know, I was like, just never expected that to happen again. So fast forward a year. And it was right when like the first edition of the butter stick came out, like we redid the waders. Uh, it was when the vaping was coming out. So they had like a big kind of a relaunch of the product line, the behemoth was then too. Um, so they're like, hey, we need to do another shoot. We need to get content. You were great on the Deschutes one. So do you want to come back out and we'll we'll spend a couple days fishing the Mackenzie in Oregon? And I was like, yeah, awesome. <laughs> you know, like two to make it true. Yeah. Um, did that and then within that, me and the brand director at the time just talked about marketing stuff, basically, you know, like she was asking me how my deal with bike riding worked out. And I kind of explained her like my journey through bike riding, like starting out, like I was sponsored by a bike shop and then I got sponsored by a bike company and a parts company and a shoe company and an energy drink company. And, you know, like, and it was just this tiered spectrum and it started with like, you, I would get parts and then I'd get like a little travel budget and then I'd get a bigger travel budget. And I got like, you know, it was all incentive based because there was print at the time and, and print meant a lot. So if I got a photo in a magazine, I got X amount of dollars for a page and, you know, and it was just kind of like explained to her like how that process worked and what it looked like. And she's like, within that conversation of like, because I... Within bike riding, I had a signature line of parts. I had a frame and a bars, and, and I started that from square one and worked through the whole thing. Like having an art background, I did all the graphics, and I was there. I went to Taiwan and like got to stand on the production line and see it bit made and do little wow. QA, you know? Like, so it was just like, she's like, well, how do you know all of this stuff, basically? And I was like, I don't know. I just pay attention, I guess, and yeah. I want to be as, as active as anybody will let me, you know? For sure. And she's like, you're a great asset to have for any brand. He's, she's like, this makes sense. Like, do you want to just start with us? Like, do you want to just be a sponsored person for Reddington? And she's like, it doesn't really exist, but it should. Yeah. So let's let's try it out, you know? And so I was, you know, subject number one on Reddington. And she kind of built the team out a little bit from there. And it's kind of evolved into what it is now. And it's, you know, I think that Reddington as a brand has done a really good job of like, pulling people that aren't necessarily like your stereotypical fly yes. fishing people because you know our sport at the time it hadn't quite turned the corner as being like a younger person sport it yeah. was i think the whole fly fishing industry was like really scrambling to figure out how we're going to make this a you know a long-term thing and within that like you know fly fishing obviously speaks to everybody and you know I, and i ran through it like going into fly shops at the time of being like I don't look like a typical fly fisherman, you know? So it was just like, they would just blow me off kind of. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the case now. I think we've all learned that like, we look like everybody, right? And that's yeah. such an important thing. And I think Reddington from day one has been really like on the edge of that. So it's been a pretty cool experience, like being there from day one and like really seeing how effective it can be. Plus like how the sport as a whole or the lifestyle as a whole is like really gravitated towards that. Yeah, inclusivity is really, really dope. Yeah. And I love how much it's changed. And like you said, everybody feels apart and connected now. Yeah. And that's I, you can't you can't put enough gold into that. You know what I mean? It's huge. And I think you're right. Reddington, man, feels like they're at the forefront of making that happen. They're bringing in folks who are who are not like old traditionalists. And that's big. Yeah. Uh, it says a lot. It says a lot where you guys want to go and what you're trying to do. Um, and I think that's why it resonates so well with so many people. Uh, it's huge. Yeah. And it's been great having like, you know, I think a brand that's catered towards me and what I am into, like both stylistically and, you know, that goes through apparel and the rods and, yeah. and everything is just a little bit different than like the Trailblazer is a perfect example. It's a bright red rod, right? Like we live in a world of black and green. Yeah. That's the old, you go to the fly shop and you're like, every rod is black and green. Like just having the the wherewithal to like do something a little bit different or like having that is it like really speaks to someone like me that's just like I don't I don't necessarily want to be the same exact cookie cutter as everybody else. Yeah. So 
I mean, it works for me. <laughs> I, I, you know what? And dude, it works for a ton of folks, which is why I think it's successful. Yeah. Because everybody can go, well, I love the butter stick because it's different. Yeah. I love the trailblazer because it's different and I'm not like everybody else on the water. Yeah. And I think that's huge. I think that is that full circle piece of bringing everybody in and making people feel comfortable. Yeah, it's great. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't feel like it's gimmicky at all, no, right? Because yeah. it's, it's the pr quality product is still there. Yeah. Like, and I'm a full believer and like it's not the product it's you like yes. if you're a good angler you can fish with a stick you know <laughs> right, like yeah. and i mean lefty made that famous right he yeah. can cast he's like i don't need a rod i can cast 80 feet you know like yeah. that's it in a nutshell like yes the tool can help you right but you shouldn't rely on the tool to get the job done and you know i think that like just having a above standard product is only going to help you at a price point that you know a broke bike kid could afford yeah. you know like this isn't a cheap world we live in, so no. it's nice to, you know, if it were up to me, I'd have, if I had the budget to spend like $1,200, I'm going to buy two to three setups, not one. Right, know? yeah, no. Cover all the games. Yeah, I'm also yeah. the idiot that will try to catch whatever's around, so. <laughs> so maybe we go transition into that. Um, favorite species. Oh, God. Um, That's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. Or maybe you've been everywhere, fished everywhere for just about every fish out there. What's one of those moments where you're like, man, this one just really is on the top of my, my memory list, if you will, of, of experiences? Um, I think like first flats fish meant a lot because it was on my own, like yeah. weren't guiding, you know, I caught a bonefish, you know, and it was... I came from like carp fishing a ton. So to me, like catching a bonefish was, I thought it was gonna be this really hard thing. And I was like, oh, you put it in front of them and you strip it and they eat it, okay. But it was just like the <laughs> feeling of like, I could figure this out, you know? Yeah. Like, and so that meant a lot. Um, you know, first steelhead meant a lot just because it was such a learning curve of like, there's so much more to steelhead fishing than just like showing up to the river and fishing, right? Like yes. there's. I, I feel like, and I'm not knocking trout fishing, but if you go to a river and it's in shape and there's trout in the river, you'll catch the trout. You just have to figure out maybe where they're at. True. A steelhead is like, you could fish for two days and there might not be a fish in that section, you know? And there's you know, what level it's at, what run fishes well during that level, what water clarity, what fly, you know, like there's so many things and I made it harder on myself that I only wanted to swing for them. I don't want to nymph for them. I, I'm also the person that doesn't want to nymph for basically anything. I don't think that that's fly fishing in my world, but again, I don't, I'm not here to judge anybody how yeah. anybody wants to do it. That's just my personal thing. Like, I think that fly fishing is a perfect thing of we've already chosen the hardest way to catch a fish <laughs> no you know doubt. so like if catching your fish is your number one objective fly fishing probably isn't for you and it's everything else that goes behind it yeah and so i'm a firm believer in that and still it's funny because i respect the fish so much that i i feel like i owe it to them to catch them in this very you know what's the word that i'm looking for Arduous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a perfect one, actually. Because it was Method, it five you know? years like, before you caught one? Yeah, I mean, that's a weird scoped thing. So I'll let the cat out of the bag. I caught one before we filmed that video. Oh, snap. I'd actually caught a couple. But it was all right then. Like, something oh, happened okay. that, yeah. like, before that shoot happened, like, something just clicked. Like, yeah. I don't know if it was just I had figured out the water temperature or I fished with the right people or whatever. Like, but I'd caught a couple, so it was, like, and it's and it is one of those things too, like like all the fishing, like once you have the the you know, the confidence that you will catch yeah. it, you start catching them. Yeah. You know, it's like you're like, I'm doing everything right. And that goes back to the fly thing. Like I mean the fly is whatever, like you could fish a woolly bugger ninety eight percent of the time, and if you believe in the woolly bugger, you'll catch fish on it, you know? Like yeah. so but yeah, those two probably were the biggest to me, you know, like on a grand scope of things, like figuring out carp fishing in Phoenix was very big like i had one i would call him a mentor that like kind of taught me how to do it but at the time there was no one carp fishing like i could fish wherever i wanted in the phoenix metro for carp and i would just get dirty looks and now it's a thing which is amazing you know like you can catch a 40 pound grass carp within a mile of wherever you're at in the metro like phoenix metropolitan area whether it's in a golf course or a 
pond or a the, you know the canals are obviously the yeah the easiest options but you know just figuring that out because we didn't really have anything to go from you know like yeah. we learned everything by just like no one caught these fish no one had written anything about catching these fish i don't want to say no one there were there were definitely people that did but there wasn't like a bunch of info out there like there is now like right. now you can go to the fly shop and they go okay use this go here you know and it's perfect it's all laid it's out all for you. dialed in yeah i also kind of hate that i think it like robs the experience sure. to the to the fishermen like i feel like again back to the fly fishing thing is so much of fly fishing is like learning all of these things and learning it on your own the chase like right. you can have a little pushes in the right direction but it means so much more when you're like i did this like i figured this out like yeah you can you can own it a little bit but the carp fishing was it was really cool to like be able to consistently do it you know and it was again as a confidence thing like I would watch, I, I used to just go sit on the canal and just watch the fish. I'm like, what the hell are they eating? Like, yeah. there's nothing in the water and you're coming up and eating stuff like it's dry flies. And I'm like, okay, well, let's try this. Nope, 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 <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and then finally it kicks in and then you figure out little things and then you get experimental and it's just this whole world of like, I mean, that's progression in a nutshell, you know, like sure. we were lucky that before us with trout, you know, trout fishing started, you know, Sir Isaac Walton. Yeah. 1400s? <laughs> like, long time, yeah, long time ago. There's a lot yeah. of history on that side. That's but, true. you know, the Americans and the carp, it's pretty relatively new. So it's it's been cool to play that game. Do you still have the state record for the, <laughs> the sucker? No, it got beat, <laughs> which is great. The suckers are funny. There was kind of another one. Like, they, they stock this river outside of Phoenix called the Salt River with trout in the winter. They start stocking in November, and they stop in March when the water temps get warm. And yeah. they, they basically cut the flows because they don't need power okay, yeah. as much in the winter months because no one's running ACs. Yeah. So they, they hold up all the water in the reservoirs for summer to make that. So, you know, the water basically turns into, like, a trickle. And so there's just big a series of big pools, and the trout fishing is stocked trout, so it's you know it's entertaining for about two, yeah. And then you're over it. Um, but we kept seeing all these like pretty big suckers, you know. And that was another one of just like I don't know how to catch these things. I don't know what they eat. I think they're like I think they eat algae. Yeah, green like, stuff. Yeah, green stuff. And I'm like okay. And then we started swinging soft tackles because we would see a bunch of mayfly nymphs. And swing soft tackles would pick them up in the riffles. And I was like, okay, that works. And then you're like, all right, well, I see more of them in the pools than I do in the riffles. Let's figure out how to catch those ones. And it was just like a, okay, let's try like a little worm. That worked somehow. Okay. And then you just, you know, again, it just evolves. And the, the state record was funny because I basically was like, again, with the carp, it was like, I'm one of like a handful of people that do this. Like, I looked up the state record. I'm like, I catch these every day. You know, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, and I was like, I catch this every day. So let's, let's, I don't know, as a joke, like I'm moving in a month, like let's catch one and measure it. So I caught one that day, measured it, submitted it, got the state record, which if I would have killed it would have been a world record because they only exist in that watershed. Oh, wow. It's a Sonoran sucker. Um, but yeah, it was completely forethought. I don't really care about records or anything. I'm not no. the competitive person like Ethan that I'm with is, is very competitive fly fisherman. He's on, he does the Euro nymph stuff like i'm not that competitive with anything maybe pool, <laughs> maybe pool. <laughs> um, but yeah it was cool and then you know coincidentally like i have a really good friend that got into sucker fishing and he tried to beat it for like two years oh wow and he's like no argument the best carp sucker fisherman in phoenix currently like i go home and i'm like josh what do i do you know? and he's like, yeah i'm like please teach me again <laughs> um and he for some reason would just be like a quarter of an inch short a quarter of an inch short a quarter of an inch short and then um another like friend alex that works for game and fish caught one that was like an inch larger and i was like thank you right. <laughs> you know like and he's deserving like he studies those fish and now he's like the activist for that fish and they're doing a bunch of studies through game and fish to like really figure out like what they do where they go what they eat the yeah. growth rates like how how old is a 25 inch sucker like is wow. it two yeah. years is it 20 years like there's no info on those things at all so it's been really interesting to like you know it and it kind of goes to that conservation mind is that you know fishermen are needed in this world because without a little bit of love for a species there's no knowledge and there's nothing going to be no one to save them true you know it sounds counterproductive like fishermen are saving species 
I mean, it sounds like an oxymoron, but in the reality is like, hey, we all want something to fish for, yeah. so we're going to do whatever we can to keep that thing around. Exactly. Yeah. Steelhead's a perfect example of that, you know? Yep. But yeah, fun journey. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That sounds super dope. I've, I've always wanted to go carp fishing here. Uh, Taylor, one of our guys, he's huge into it. I think you're right. Like, find something that's not so... You know, it's so pervasive out there where you're going to go chase it. It's a little bit different. You're learning yeah. more about it. Yeah. You know, it's that, I think that's the goal for fly anglers is, you know, I want it to be, obviously, like you said, we want it to be difficult. You know, we pick the hardest way to try to capture yeah. them. You might as well try to catch the hardest one. That's just carp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, used to, I used to look at the, because the Denver carp fishing scene was, you know, ahead of everybody else, it seemed. So, like, I used to read everything I could about Denver <coughs> carp fishing, like Barry Reynolds' book and all of that stuff. And that was, I was trying to, like, adapt that information into Phoenix, and it didn't work. Right, like yeah. Every, and that's what you learn is, yeah, is that every carp in different places act completely different. Like, yeah. they eat crayfish and stuff here. In Oregon, they don't eat anything that moves. Oh, you're wow. You're fishing mussels, so you're dropping it and dragging it and dropping it on their nose and watching them come over and tail on it. Ah, okay. You know, like, so yeah. it's, it's just such a different world, but, but that's what makes it also, it makes it very interesting, right? It's like yeah. you have to figure out that species or subspecies of carp or just environmentally based on what they're doing. And that's where, like, you know, that really taught me how to, like, watch and not just fish, you know? Yes. And that's a perfect rule for trout as well. You see trout feeding in an eddy, like, don't just go cast. Like, sit there and watch them and see exactly the rhythm or, you know, it's, it's a big deal, especially in somewhere like this state where everything's got so much pressure. Like, yeah. just watching for a while will, will definitely... You can learn so out. much more <laughs> if you slow down. Yeah. You just enjoy where you're at and just breathe it all in. Because, yeah. I mean, not, it's not about catching a lot of fish or catching big fish. Yeah. It's the experience and the connection with nature. And I think, I think you're right. If we would just take a step back, watch the water, appreciate the, you know, the resource. Um, yeah. I, I think a lot of young people, for some reason, skip over that. And they're like, oh, I just got to get in the water right now. I think, I think everybody does naturally, right? Because, you, yeah. you know, what? I don't remember who wrote the quote, but it, the quote is like, you know, the steps of fly fishing is like, you want to catch a fish. You want to catch a bunch of fish. Oh, yeah. You yeah, want to yeah. catch a big fish. You want to <laughs> catch a bunch of big fish. <laughs> you know, like, and you're just like. Yeah. And so then it just, it all ultimately ends up at like, you're clipping the hook off your fly and you just want to see it get eaten. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, I just want that slow top yeah. water eat. Right. You're like, I don't, I don't care about anything else anymore. I just yeah. want to be outside. And if I can fool one that eats something, that's awesome. That's a win right there. <laughs> um, so, What's on the, the, the agenda for 2024 in, in, in the Badger world? Mm. What's, what's the, you guys are on the tour, <laughs> the tour right now. Yeah, we're on, I mean, technically state one of the tour where we started in Phoenix and kind of floored it as fast as we could to Colorado. And we basically started in Durango and we're just like kind of just cruising back to Oregon slowly. Like, I think this is a three and a half week road trip. That's dope. Which sounds like it's a super long time. And I was like, this is awesome. We're going to get to fish so much. And like, so we quick. fish like for a couple hours and we're like, dude, we got to drive. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you guys are covering a ton of yeah, ground a tunnel, tunnel in a very thing. short period of time. So, like, when, as soon as you pulled up, I was like, dude, how much have you guys fished? <laughs> yeah, not much. Yeah. I mean, we fished, we fished the wand for like an hour on the way up, um, which is cool because I hadn't been there in. 12 years probably um we didn't fish in durango we were gonna fish the animus and then just kind of just ran out of time yeah um and then we fished the arc on the way up here just right in salida and it was super good so it was fun yeah i love the arc yeah it's beautiful out there so i mean that was a fun thing but yeah mo more than anything we're just like kind of just dropping into fly shops yeah. and saying hi and thank you and you know just saying what's up to whoever's around and we'll yeah, I mean, we'll just getting to, us, to hang you know? out with people is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, you're just making more connections. Yeah, it's totally. good stuff all around. Um, I, I love what you guys are doing. I love this road trip idea. Um, it, it, it's a no-brainer to me, like, connecting with folks. Yeah. makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I love it. I think everybody here is very stoked about it. Um, I'm really excited for, for what's to come and, and what Reddington is going to bring, you Same. know? Um, <laughs> There's definitely some cool new things in the works. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll, we'll all see them soon enough. But, yeah, just we'll be trudging forward, you know, trying to make our way.
There you go. <laughs> one one uh, tail flip at a time yeah, or something. Right. Upstream. No, there you go. What the hell I'm talking about. Well, super cool, man. We yeah. really appreciate you here. Thank yeah. you so Cheers. much for Thanks doing for the coffee. coffee break. <laughs> you guys be safe. See you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks for having me.